All right. How was everyone's weekend? It's like the time of the semester where weekends and days and whatever are all the same. So more on the brain. We'll finish up the basic brain function, uh, neurotransmitters, and we'll get into some factors, right? Contributing factors and what those things are. And then we'll move into you know, the zone or flow or whatever after that, followed by exercise and interactions and how to manipulate exercise to accomplish stuff. Um, but at some point, we will do a maybe geriatric or at least older adults case study in your groups and figuring out how to best accommodate the needs of an older adult, um, especially somebody who has some risk factors or age related uh, complications. And remember the stuff about telomeres and senescence. Uh, consider balance and functionality in your prescription of that. So this is where we started. We still have these to go. We'll finish this one today. And then in the next couple of lectures, we'll do these two. And I think April um, Shalai, this is her last name now, uh, Berenik, when um, she, Travis Stiles, and I were all students together in our undergrad. And so she is a neural physical therapist now and works in-house physical therapy, travels around, complicated patients, they can't leave the home. I think she's going to do a guest lecture probably right after uh, Thanksgiving break, potentially right before, but probably right after Thanksgiving break. And so that's, so Travis did his guest lecture about the research side and uh, April will do one about the clinical practice side of neural uh, function and development and therapy. Uh, just remember that the, the cerebral cortex, I mean, this is four fifths of your brain matter, four fifths of your brain matter and one fifth of your neurons, ballpark figures, um, you know, just under a hundred billion neurons, 80 something billion neurons, maybe 90, something like that. The cerebellum houses the bulk of those neurons. The cerebellum, which isn't that much meat, the actual physical structure is not that large, and it has a lot of functions. Uh, you can tell what a brain region does very effectively by damaging it and then seeing what deficits uh, exist in the person. And if you damage the cerebellum, motor function is really compromised. Now, the, the primary motor cortex, which generates all of these, where these alpha motor nerves live, where this voluntary muscle recruitment takes place, that's not the cerebellum. Uh, you can still move. If you damage the cerebellum, you can still move, but you're not going to be a surgeon unless you're like doing it with a hacksaw and that's part of your shtick. Um, you're not going to be a musician. Right, you're not going to be an artist. Delicate, well controlled, um, coordinated movements will vanish from your uh, ability. So the cerebellum is critical to movement, but it's not where the alpha motor nerves live. But there's a lot of uh, neurons there. Now, the neurons, this yellow thing, right? This yellow thing. We have a neuron. We receive. Uh, information from other nerves, receive information at the dendrites from other nerves, and uh, thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of uh, uh, communicating, and then we discharge down here uh, at the axon terminal. Then we have all these glial cells um, that perform, you know, you can't, like, let's say this is our department, and the message is relayed by the professor whoever's teaching the class, but you can't do it without all the supporting sort of administrative roles, all of these, um, whether it's like an office administrator or whatever, all of these additional roles are necessary so that uh, information can be relayed. And you remember what the synapse is. It's the I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you. Um, so it's like, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty much 
touching though. That's the Sistine, that's the Michelangelo painting, the Sistine Chapel. Um, and the it's it's a chemical communication across such a tiny space that it might as well be touching, but it's not quite. You're gonna release some little neurotransmitter from one hand, communicating to the next hand, go put on your fig leaf or whatever. Uh, and so that is going to be these, these uh, junctions. Now it could be, again, it doesn't have to be nerve to nerve, it could be nerve to tissue. If it's nerve to muscle, right? That's how we release acetylcholine um, out of those terminals and activate the uh, muscle that way. But we have these myelin sheets, right, which really increase the speed of, of communication. And um, what's called saltatory conduction, you just leap from all node to node, communicate with that one, that one communicates somewhere else. Um, different types of nerves, remember there are motor nerves and there are sensory nerves. Motor nerves come out of the ventral roots, they come out of the front. Sensory nerves, the afferents come into the dorsal root in the back. So the motor, um, the efferent effectors come out of the front. Sensory afferent comes in the back. And then there's also interneurons. But within these neurons, there are different classes. There are different types of neurons. So those are just the parent uh, categories of them. Remember glutamate, primary excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. GABA, primary inhibitory neurotransmitter. And in youth, in development, uh, when you see a lot of GABA, again, in, in developmental states, uh, it seems to associate with better plasticity. Uh, now, looking at mathematical achievement, learning is comprehensive, learning and you know, motor learning and math learning and language, and there's so many different expressions, types of learning, that looking at mathematical achievements and trying to generalize to other you know, states is a little bit um, inappropriate. It, it, it's going to lead you down some false conclusion roads. But um, in youth, you seem to have GABA associating with, with neuroplasticity. But in adults, in everyone in the room, glutamate associates with learning much better. Glutamate, excitatory neurotransmitter is much better for learning. And with glutamate, we have ionotropic and metabotropic receptors, ionotropic ions, charged things, charged stuff uh, is going to pass, ionotropic ion uh, receptors. And then the metabotropic receptors, cell signaling cascades, right? There's a second messenger system. There's a relay race uh, that's going to alter some sort of probably protein um, translation, gene expression. So remember, we have a presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron. Here's the synapse, and this is all glutamate. These little like, blue balls, little blue circles, those are all glutamate. Glycine is there too, augmenting the NMDA receptor activity. But remember, glycine is actually inhibitory. It's just not inhibitory in this role. The glycine is otherwise inhibitory. Um, now, after you release glutamate, and you don't, it's not an all or none principle. And it's not like motor recruitment and skeletal muscle where the nerve either fires or doesn't fire. Uh, it fires maximally or it doesn't fire at all in, in skeletal muscle recruitment. If you're for exocytosis, for releasing these neurotransmitters, um, it's not an all or none principle, right? You can, you can release a little bit, a lot, a ton. Uh, in there, and it, it's going to bind, right? The binding, uh, the, the intensity of the effect, the signal is partly based on how much glutamate is released, but also based on the concentration, the density of those glutamate receptors. So if you just have more AMPA receptors or have more NMDA receptors, you're going to have more activity, whatever, it is whatever the signal that's being transmitted is that signal is louder and clearer and more prominent if you have more uh, receptors. Now, after you you dump your glutamate, you have to dispose of it. It doesn't just stay there forever. You don't just keep your glutamate there.
for eternity, you dispose of it. Now, some of it you can reabsorb in the presynaptic terminal. Some of that glutamine can be reabsorbed in that presynaptic, that, that neuron. Some, a tiny, tiny bit, um, you can absorb in the postsynaptic cell. A little bit, I mean, just a tiny amount. A, a great amount of it, a great deal of it, um, gets absorbed in the glial cells and converted into glutamine glutamate back to glutamine and then release for other nerves inside of the nerves they convert it back to glutamate um, so they can reuse it as an excitatory neurotransmitter so those are the three ways to dispose of that glutamate once exocytosis has happened once it has dumped its sauce uh, into that synapse some just a tiny bit a bunch disposing of it that way not really disposing but recycling recycling it uh, that way. Remember the AMPA receptors when it binds, uh, we're letting sodium in. With the NMDA receptors, we're letting in both sodium and calcium. And calcium has a lot of regulatory functions. Uh, as a positively charged ion, changing the charge, sure, that's one thing. Sodium is pretty good at that. Calcium tends to be very good at changing signaling. Um, the canate receptors seem to be less important and are, are much less uh, characterized, but changing the concentration, right, the, the uh, density of these receptors is going to change the likelihood of firing together. Again, the reason that you would do serial practicing of a scale, if it's music, or like a fencing move or something like you take up karate and you're not you don't want to think when you're in a fight someone goes to punch you i, I remember when i was in elementary school i don't want to say your name because this is on tape but uh there's this girl in the in the class who she was like a sixth or seventh degree black belt. i'm in the sixth grade and there's somebody in the class who's like a you know a bunch of degrees black belt in taekwondo and I assumed that meant super impressive. And she's like, no, 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 come up like you're gonna punch me. I'm like, okay. She's like, whoa, slow down. Um, okay. No, 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 don't, don't, okay, put, put your arm in this position and come at this angle. But that's not how a fight works. That's a fights don't work like that. You know, you come up and like poke them in the eye, like, oh, duh, that is not Taekwondo. You know, that's how, like, so a lot of these forms of martial arts, what they do well though is not let me think and plan. Okay, here's the point where I do that. You don't wanna use conscious processing. You wanna be like a baseball player. The pitch comes at 90 miles an hour and you don't think at all. It's unconscious processing that decides how and when, uh, if you swing at all. That's not, that's not conscious processing. And so any of these things require a lot of uh, repetition. You're not going to be able to do your Taekwondo eye probe effectively or the defense against it if you haven't had these series this repetition after repetition after repetition after repetition same thing with music same thing with i don't know video games that are like challenging in terms of timing or, or button sequences you need a bunch of repetition to connect these uh, nerves long-term potentiation learning uh, effective learning long-term depression uh, you're getting a little bit sparse here where you've wiped out some of the population. There's also sensitivity issues. Uh, metabotropic, uh, track A, tropomyosin receptor kinase A, uh, receptor tyrosine kinase, tropomyosin receptor kinase A. Uh, remember, nerve growth factor, track B is BDNF. We're gonna talk about BDNF today, brain-derived neurotropic factor, but cell signaling cascades, right? These are cell signaling cascades. And there's a few kinds uh, of these metabotropic receptors uh, for glutamate and the different functions uh, that they have. But it, there continues to be a lot of calcium stuff, a lot of calcium uh, regulation. But the important point here is consistent firing, repetitive, consistent firing, practice that scale over and over and over. Um, if you are a singer, do your do re mis over and over, whatever it is, practice there's a thousand cliches each stupider than the other one about like practice me perfect or whatever um the only one this is the cliche too and i hate cliches because it pains me to release this from my mouth 
But practice does make permanent. Practice um, uh, solidifies neural characteristic, neural recruitment patterns, it solidifies those, it cements them uh, into, into kind of a repeat performance. So neural plasticity is constantly happening. Right now, neural plasticity is happening in everyone in this room, uh, but having an optimal uh, plastic process, an optimal ability to make changes uh, to enhance cognitive functioning, performance, whatever it is. <clears throat> Lots of signaling happening inside of, inside of the cell. You'll recognize again, we saw this one on last week. So, you know, substance P and CGRP, calcitonin gene-related peptide, these two, the nerve itself releases. Um, and it's this inflammatory soup, uh, neurogenic inflammation, nerve-generated inflammation, bradykinins and prostaglandins and histamine, and, and there's your opiates. Um, there's your endogenous cannabinoids. We'll talk about those later this week, probably on Friday. We'll, we'll talk about anandamide. Um, we have we have receptors for that, which is why THC works. Now, remember we talked about a few neurotransmitters. Uh, these each one of these uh, is a monoamine neurotransmitter, meaning it's a single amino acid. Uh, serotonin is made from tryptophan. Uh, norepi and dopamine are made from tyrosine. Right? So these, these are catecholamines. Norepi and dopamine, those are catecholamines. Um, and then serotonin is not. But there, it's still a, a monoamine. And there's a lot of functions for these things. A lot of functions. And with serotonin, I mentioned that most of it is in your gut. Right, most of his motility. It's let's get our poops on the march. Uh, we ate some, and some, there are some foods that have a lot of serotonin in it, um, like walnuts, stuff like that. And probably the effect is time in transit, right? Whatever creatures are, are eating these things, I want you to get it out of your colon immediately so that maybe it can still grow in the earth. You know, maybe we can mobilize our seeds through your colon and then out wherever you took your dump. Uh, so it, it exists in some foods, but serotonin has a ton of uh, gastric roles. The bulk of all of your serotonin is manipulating, regulating your fecal bulk. Um, what we care about, though, for the context of this class, is the psychological, cognitive, neural effects of serotonin. And it's diverse, very diverse. Um, there's some stuff with a circadian rhythms and sleep-wake cycle, um, pain sensitivity, uh, appetite aggression, sexual behavior. Uh, it gets into you know, anxiety disorders and anorexia, um, gambling. Dopamine is, is more, it's a bit more famous for, for gambling, but you know, attention deficit. There's a lot of cognitive roles that have been assigned to uh, serotonin. And then serotonin and dopamine do seem to move in tandem a little bit. Each of these neurotransmitters does not work in isolation. These neurotransmitters have um, community roles, right? They influence uh, other neurotransmitters and other types of signaling. Norepinephrine, this is our amplifier, right? The attention, the focus, um, this, I, I said last time that whatever task where you find yourself in the zone or so focused that the sun starts coming up and you go, oh, shit, I gotta go to bed. Do you guys have activities like that that you connect with it so much that you don't notice the passing time and you're doing whatever it is? It could be a hobby. It's almost never work. It's usually some sort of you know, hobby, that's where the real passion is lies and hobbies. Uh, and you're, you're doing it, it's, I don't know, it's 6 p.m. and you start and you look out the window, and you're like, oh, I gotta be working three hours or something. I mean, this is, you're gonna be having a lot of you know, epinephrine and dopamine and, and these, these experiences when you find yourself sort of in the zone or that flow state, we'll, we'll talk about all that. Um, but the name, the nomenclature, 
norepinephrine. Remember, you're going to see it as noradrenaline too. Um, dude, this is an article where name and image meet the argument for adrenaline. You really <laughs> bias it. It's, it'll be uploaded. You'll see it later today if you, if you care to look uh, in the in the folder for this lecture. But a pretty biased argument about a guy who hates the word epinephrine and, and loves the word adrenaline. And I agree, mostly, I, I agree. Um, but he, he, you look through the world and, and what people use, whether it's adrenaline or epinephrine, Japan, Canada, US, we are epinephrine folks, right? You get into, into publications and we talk about epi. Um, Australia, UK, France, who are adrenaline over there. And some of the arguments, so some of it is, he, he talks about, you know, if we all use epinephrine, doctors are gonna accidentally grab a veteran thinking it's epinephrine and there's gonna be a crisis. And at first, you know, when I first read this article, I'm like, oh, that's really stupid. That's not gonna happen. But then I, I reflected on my experience with doctors and that would happen probably 50% of the time, I mean, 50% of doctors. So there's, there's, he does present a pretty good argument, and then, but it does get a little bit biased. Not only is adrenaline the preferred technical term in most countries in the world, it is also the non-technical term for what people think of as a substance surge through your body when you're on a high, even in America. No one anywhere ever talks about a surge of epinephrine. That's that maybe not quite true. The surge of epinephrine is probably the expression among physiological folk in Japan, in Canada, in the US. But there, there's a point, uh, about the nomenclature and epinephrine and adrenaline lump those together as the same thing, right? Epi is the same thing as ad, right? Nephrologist or adrenal, you know, epi -neph -in. Um, If you see the nephrologist, that's your kidney doctor. If you have an adrenal uh, problem, that's your kidneys. Um, but then looking at, at what the functions of, of epinephrine uh, are, uh, norepinephrine, remember epinephrine is the adrenal gland, and that is your um, your endocrine hormone goes circulating around in systemic circulation. Nor adrenaline or nor epinephrine. This is the neurotransmitter. It's released from the nerves, not the uh, kidney. The bulk of, of this is released from from the nerves. This is uh, facilitates sensory signal detection and promotes waking and arousal processes which are necessary for navigating a complex and dynamic uh, sensory environment. So we're gonna talk about uh, how to achieve that, oh shit, it's light out, the sun is coming up state. What uh, environmental stimuli arouse that state? And it's a lot of dynamic sensory environment. Um, that's part of that recipe to elicit this norepinephrine response. Um, but in addition to its effects on sensory processing and waking behavior, norepinephrine is now recognized to contribute to various aspects of cognition, including attention, behavioral flexibility, working memory, and long-term uh, mnemonic processing. So there's a lot of learning, the attention, the focus, and the learning uh, that comes from it. And a couple of areas uh, that are particularly dense with noradrenergic uh, intervention, uh, uh, innovation, the hippocampus is important. And we're gonna keep talking about the hippocampus as uh, the seahorse of the school, uh, transitioning this acute information that you're just temporarily retaining uh, into long-term storage, the side of the brain that is, that is really responsible for that. Dopamine, remember, this is really the gambling uh, neurotransmitter. The unpredictability of the reward seems to elicit a bigger dopamine response. And trying to decipher, to solve the puzzle, the riddle, if there's some mystery that keeps you turning pages, there's, that's going to be dopamine involved. Trying to figure it out, trying to, to decipher. Now, in pathological situations, pathological gamblers, people who have lost their home and have like stolen other people's credit cards and maxed those out so they can continue to accumulate gambling debt. Those losses associate with uh, 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 an additional dopamine release. So you can tell if somebody is likely to be a pathological gambler by the, the dopamine signature, the dopamine 
uh, characteristics um, in, in losses, not necessarily in, um, in winning. Uh, so then this, if this is me on Friday, right? I photoshop myself, there's me wearing the you have died of chain dream. So, so this idea of, of how to employ dopamine if you are a content creator of some sort, right? Whether that's you're like in film, you're in literature, it's video games, it is some sort of experience, right? You're setting up, it could be for lectures. I don't do it, but really effective professors probably do it. They in, incorporate little riddles and mysteries at the start of the class. And then you have to pay attention so you can solve the riddle at the end. And you know there's a promise, the hook, at the beginning is here's a puzzle, here's a riddle, here's a mystery. It's solvable, but we haven't solved it yet. I'm not gonna tell you the answer. I'm gonna withhold information and I'll, I'll go along to the end of the lecture and then I'll pre present the solution, which you should have figured out by the clues I let. You know, you can do that in whatever you're doing. And as I mentioned that this author, Pat Rothfuss, is you know, among my favorite living writers, but I decided yesterday uh, to look up Name of the Wind, that's his the first book. Name of the Wind Theories, 42 and a half million results. American Government Conspiracy Theories, just fewer results. But like, well, that's, that's a really crude metric. Let me put some stuff in quotation marks. But maybe wind theories are something like physicists and geologists and, and um, whatever. Um, so, quote, Name of the Wind Theory, about 12 and a half million. American government conspiracy theory, 10,500. It's a way of saying, if you do it right, again, very crude assessment, but if you do it right, people care more about fiction. People care more about solving the mystery, even when it's fake, even when somebody just made it up. People care so much about solving that mystery that you can spend your entire life watching uh, fan and reading uh, fan theories about how it will resolve. And no matter what it is, you create some little Easter egg and hide it somewhere. And today, the dopamine, it, it just, it, we get this surge of dopamine and we have to solve the riddle and page turns, page turns, page turns, page turns, page turns. If you don't get an answer, you go back to the beginning and start turning those pages and then the sun comes up. And oh shit, I have to work with three hours, right? So whatever you're doing, you can create content uh, that will serve that role. Now, um, a lot of people have imbalances of some kind. Uh, depression is among the most common ailments suffered by every upright bipedal creature who's ever lived. Depression and anxiety, uh, anybody who experiences these is like the majority, you're not alone in, in cognitive stuff. I mean, you're like among the majority. Now, gradations of severity um, should be acknowledged, but um, addressing it with neurotransmitters is one solution. We'll talk about addressing with exercise in a couple of days, uh, but addressing it with, with uh, modulation of neurotransmitters, that's the first one right there, Prozac, and these SSRIs, um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Remember when, with glutamate, the ways of getting rid of the glutamate once it's in that synapse, you can reuptake it, you can absorb it into the other the postsynaptic neuron um, or glial cells can take it up, convert to glutamine and, and make use of it, recycle it that way. With serotonin, if you block and say, no, 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 you're not coming back in here, serotonin hangs out longer and prolongs that effect, um, amplifies and prolongs the effect of, of serotonin. And these, in the literature, the published literature, these work well. In the unpublished literature, it's a slightly different story. Are these two, especially this one, New England Journal of Medicine, top journal in the world, um, looking at and uh, this guy, John Unides, uh, probably the most famous researcher uh, to call bullshit on X, solve for X. What, whatever the, the statistical or medicinal phenomenon is, this is the guy who's probably the most famous kind of that's bullshit caller um, and does it beautifully. Um, and 
but the unpublished data, right? This is biased uh, by the pharmaceutical industry of how effective these things are. And it's not just serotonin and dopamine are common. Those are, those are common targets. GABA is another target uh, for uh, anxiety. Now, there's more to it than this. We've been talking about monoamine neurotransmitters. Let's add some amino acids to it. Arexin. Right now, there's uh, arexin A and arexin B, 33 and 28 amino acids in sequence, respectively. Um, but arexin has a lot of these attention roles. What you would assign to uh, sort of a combination of dopamine and uh, norepinephrine, arexin does have uh, some of those roles. Uh, the difference between sleep and awake states is partly attributable to orexin. And a lot of stuff modulates it. And orexin modulates other things as well. But when you start looking at the neurotransmitters and neuromodulators influencing the activation or inhibition of orexin, orexin released from neurons, um, GABA, uh, noradrenaline or norepinephrine, uh, serotonin, uh, dopamine, and then agonists of ionotropic, you know what those are, AMPA, NMDA, Agonists of ionotropic glutamate receptors tend to excite orexin neurons, while glutamate antagonist inhibitors inhibit uh, orexin activity. So if you look at orexin, and again, this difference between sleeping and waking states, what we don't want to do is muddle the two. What we don't want to do is spend the day exhausted on the verge of a nap, about to fall asleep, and sort of trying to keep awake and then lie down in bed at the end of the day and be awake and thoughtful with this agitated or otherwise racing mind. What you want to do is separate these two where, okay, over here is sleep and I do it well. Over here is waking states and I do it well. And orexin is one compound. Now, anybody who says it's the only one or it's the most important, Subtlety, you know, there's there is nuance in a lot of these physiological uh, conversations, but this is an important one. This is an important one. And you look at just different brain regions, you can ignore that part of it. But orexin, um, when you see, <clears throat> let's increase noradrenaline, norepinephrine, um, let's increase uh, serotonin, um, let's increase acetylcholine. Remember, acetylcholine is plays a lot of roles in the body. And for the skeletal muscle, that is the neurotransmitter um, from a lower motor nerve that's going to stimulate, that's going to cause the release of calcium inside of the muscle cell. Um, but acetylcholine in the brain, right, this is going to um, highlight uh, events and, and, and attention and, and uh, what you should retain um, what is deemed important in these experiences. Um, acetylcholine is probably talking about that. Orexin, increasing dopamine, right? But listen to the things that inhibit orexin. Glucose, blood sugar, right? Inhibiting orexin. So if you eat a meal that's high in carbohydrates, you reduce orexin. Part of the reason, as Thanksgiving approaches, part of the reason, not the whole reason, part of it, um, where that post-meal lethargic, you know, let me lie down on the, on the sofa and take my nap, uh, my whatever post, what do you, the, like, what do you guys call that? The food coma, the food coma. The food coma is uh, in part um, uh, orexin and inhibited orexin. Leptin also inhibited orexin. Leptin is inhibiting orexin. So uh, elevated glucose and, and leptin, satiety hormone. Now orexin is inhibited and orexin is, is helping with those waking states. Ghrelin is promoting orexin. Ghrelin, remember, this is growth hormone releasing ghrelin. Um, this one is released from your gastrointestinal tract, right? mostly your stomach, in response to an empty stomach, in response to a lonely gastrointestinal tract, Let's go acquire some food. In order to acquire food, we need to focus. In order to acquire food, 
we need to be more alert and energized and wakeful. Otherwise, the food would be in our mouth already. If it was easy, if it were easy to acquire that food, I would already be in my hands with some of my mouth. And I'd have some on a plate I'd be looking at, and I wouldn't have enough spit to swallow it all. Uh, if it were easy. So it must be harder than that. We need a little bit more attention. We need a little bit more focus. Let's get us some erection, Rowan. Um, and so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of molecules that are going to regulate our attention, that are going to regulate our mood, our focus, our sleepiness, our wakefulness. There's a lot of chemicals that are doing this. But going back to what this lecture is about, the contributing factors, right? The brain and exercise part two, contributing factors. A factor is a protein. Factors are proteins. And so brain-derived neurotrophic factor, it's a protein. Insulin-like growth factor, it's a protein, right? Vascular endothelial growth factor, fibroblast growth factor. It's a bunch of proteins. And the brain, the brain communicates, relays messages through neurotransmitters. Messages are sent by way of neurotransmitters, but the factors do a lot of facilitation. The factors uh, help assemble the, the structures that do it. You know, the, the mail carrier delivers the mail, but oh, they need that little old Jeep thing, right? They need roads. You know, they, I mean, the mail carrier, they're not going to just like go and walk through the wilderness with your, you know, yeah, there are other government agencies, you know, Department of Transportation and whatever, that contribute to the delivery of messages. If you're only paying taxes for USPS, it would be tough to get your uh, mail, to get your messages. These factors are helping to do a lot of that, starting with brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Um, now, synaptic plasticity, cognitive functions, this does a lot of regulation of that. It's regarded as the most important one, whether that's true, I'm not taking a side, but, but it is incredibly important. BDNF is incredibly important. Um, synaptic transmission, it does help with transmission itself, um, glutamate uh, release, and um, then also BDNF modulates uh, uh, inhibitory transmission. So it's very, it facilitates. It's excitatory without being glutamate itself, uh, but it potentiates those excitatory synapses. So BDNF helps uh, the release of, of glutamate, increases glutamate release. And on the postsynaptic side, so that's the presynaptic side, let's release us some more glutamate. Let's exocytosis us a little bit more uh, glutamate. On the postsynaptic side, it augments NMDA receptor uh, opening activity of the NMDA receptors. Let's get some more calcium in. Um, and then other uh, ion activity. So it just in terms of the ions, right? In, in terms of uh, mobilization of ions, BDNF is, is helpful there. Uh, lots of lots of data. This is just one more I'm talking about interaction with NMDA receptors. And remember, NMDA permits the influx of calcium, and that calcium has a lot of regulatory functions. So if you're going to um, have an effect on long-term potentiation or long-term depression, those NMDA receptors are much more important than the AMPA receptors. And BDNF does work with those NMDA receptors uh, pretty effectively. So more longer term stuff. BDNF, all of these, these neurotrophins, like a brain-derived neurotrophic factor, um, building those roadways, building the channels. You know, again, just like I said, um, they are transmitting the message. BDNF is not a neurotransmitter relaying a message, but it's building um, the architectural 
availability. It's building the environment that permits the relaying of messages and it assists in that, uh, in that relay. So, um, dendrites, where we're going to receive information in the nerve, these dendrites. Dendrology, right, is the study of trees. Dendrology is the study of trees. Dendrites are named after trees, they're just like branches. But then in the place of leaves, where leaves would be, would be neural connections, would be synapses. Just pull, pluck the leaf, find some big old tree with all these branches all over it, pluck off every leaf, and those are your synapses, where branch uh, communicates uh, with branch, or terminal uh, communicates with dendrite. Uh, and so that's the nomenclature itself. It looks like a tree. It's supposed to look like a tree um, according to its nomenclature. That's what it's named after. Um, these dendrites, they're tree-like. Um, and so here are the dendrites up here um, without the leaves, right? The, the actual nerve. The nerve, right, there's the nucleus, the cell body, and then this long axon, and we squirt out our message. We relay it to a muscle, we relay it uh, to another nerve, to a tissue. Um, now, myelin, the growth of, of myelin, um, oligodendrocytes, uh, these glial cells, right? These are the myelinating cells of the central nervous system. So if you're going to grow myelin, develop myelin, um, this is critical. These are fundamental to myelin formation in the developing CNS central nervous system and critical for myelin regeneration following injury, including uh, most common demyelinating disease, uh, multiple sclerosis. So these things are critical. How do we modulate their activity? BDNF is one way. BDNF is one way of regulating the activity of those cells, regulating the growth and maintenance of, of myelin in the central nervous system. And you recognize some of this stuff, you have ERK, we're thinking MAPK signaling, um, extracellular signal regulating kinase or mitogen activated protein kinase. Um, signaling cascades, BDNF goes through these signaling cascades and uh, you know, there's ERK, you see PI3K, PDK, AKT, PKB or AKT. Um, so BDNF to track B, there's a little glutamate over here, BDNF, to track B, track myosin receptor kinase B, or some tyrosine kinase uh, B, um, you're going through both MAPK and uh, PI3K, PKB. Um, and creating, you know, in a skeletal muscle, the proteins that you're translating, the proteins that you're synthesizing are going to be different from the proteins that you're translating, synthesizing, creating uh, in a nerve. These synaptic proteins, this is what you're generating, in part, what you're generating uh, in a nerve. And uh, again, BDNF, you know mTOR signaling. We, we spent however many lectures, seven lectures or something, uh, in block one, talking about mTOR uh, signaling. And so BDNF, uh, a lot of what it is, is working through is uh, mTOR. Now there's some additional mTOR signaling. It's not 100% BDNF. Some of the ionotropic and dopamine receptors uh, augment contribute to uh, mTOR signaling uh, in the nerves. Um, and then coactivation of MAPK. You do get coactivation, just like remember PI, um, uh, IGF. IGF does mostly PI3K, but it has Overlap, right? It has parallel activation of MPK. You see something similar with this co activation of, of MAPK. Um, so, with BDNF, uh, you know, metabotropic glutamate receptors, and MPK receptors, uh, MAPK signaling does get uh, activated as well. And in, again, block one, this is one of my slides from block one, I assign PI3K, PKB. Uh, mTOR, 12 points, right? I assigned um, NEK, ERK, RSK, 
you know, having two cases of like seven points. These are arbitrary numbers that I just said, mTOR is winning 12 to seven. Um, and so mTOR seems to be more important, but both teams have to take the field for appropriate cell signaling, for appropriate uh, protein translation. You need both of those teams taking the field and you do get mTOR and MAPK with BDNF pretty pronounced. Uh, and then you get into the long-term potentiation, both um, there's an acute, the early phase of long-term potentiation, uh, modification to existing proteins. So this sort of immediate early phase of, of adaptation, long-term uh, potentiation, uh, long-term learning. There's, there's modifications to existing proteins. The late phase is you're creating uh, dendritic proteins, right? You're, you're, you're changing the architecture itself. It's a bunch of synthesis. It's late long-term potentiation. Early, you're modifying uh, what already uh, lives there. Now, fear is something else. Um, there's a lot of research coming out now on severity of anxiety and depression and, and fear and these sort of tragic memories that, that, that affect our, something more than mood, right? Something closer to like, something between mood and soul. Uh, and how to, like if you're in a tragic accident, you're in a car and you're in an accident and everyone else in the car is just like horribly, you know, wounded, like their head's cut off and whatever. And if you're sort of okay, um, oh, the PTSD is going to be outrageous. Like the person next to you got their head chopped off and like, you're okay. Um, the PTSD, and so we're looking at some of these the signaling in uh, the plasticity of uh, sort of fear and trauma. Mm, inhibiting mTOR seems to be of value in particular situations, in some situations. And you see rapamycin doing that. You see rapamycin mTOR inhibitor having these effects. It's not just catabolic and anti-anabolic in skeletal muscle. You see cognitive effects as well uh, with rapamycin. But the summary of BDNF, of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, is um, acute function of neurons, right? Glutamate, the release of glutamate. Um, NMDA receptors, better activity with those things. And uh, regulates the myelination, central nervous system myelination, facilitates dendritic growth. This is so powerful that people have, it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit silly. And it's certainly not scientific, but calling it miracle grow, right? Throw the, these neurons in a petri dish and watch those branches grow, right? It, it's miracle grow for these things. Um, but then also protect cells from cell death from the apocalypse. So BDNF, a critical factor in creating the architecture uh, of the brain, of the central nervous system, so that uh, those neurotransmitters can do their business. Yeah, it's very malleable. The brain is very malleable. What, what people, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's the malleability of, of neurons and neuronal functioning, central nervous system activity. Um, what makes something, you know, people talk about like, oh, the cardiovascular system, very adaptable. You know, skeletal muscle and grows and shrinks, very adaptable. The brain, the central nervous system um, is incredibly plastic, malleable. Uh, now, you can tell just how malleable it is in the presence of trauma. That's the thing that changes it quickly, like first, is if somebody has a horrible experience with something, their entire worldview, their outlook changes. Um, optimism is suffocated and uh, their thinking patterns change forever. And, and oh, they just hear, I mean, think PTSD, right? A car drives by and backfires and they fall down. You know, uh, so this is the, the, the plasticity, um, the ability to change a nervous system is really pronounced. 
But what you want to do is change it to a good one. What you want to do is become better at a sport, become better at an activity, an instrument. You want to be able to, to memorize stuff and be, and be effective in their cognition, that type of plasticity, or just take drugs and plasticity, um, you know, gabapentin or something like that. Um, if anyone's on gabapentin, don't worry, I took it too. Huge doses of it, but, uh, but it changes. Uh, there's there's a there's a effect on on your chronically on your on your brain. But it's all just post Yeah, everything is really controlled by you know the meat behind your eyes, um, and so whether it's psychology or whether it's you know academic performance or whether it's athleticism, athleticism you got the cerebellum, you got the motor cortex, you know all of this is just a bunch of nerves, and those nerves. Or mountain. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's get into IGF, insulin like growth factor. We talked about this, we talked to uh, past tense uh, about IGF. Um, here's you know, lecture 16 and 17. Um, I don't know which lecture this comes from, but from lecture 16 and 17, uh, when we were doing mTOR, we're talking about IGF and seeing both uh, NAPK signaling and PI3K signaling. Now, mostly IGF is PI3K signaling. Uh, PI3K, PKB, mTOR, P70 SSK, you, you know the signal. It's not just skeletal muscle that IGF is doing. Now, exercise, you know the hypothalamic pituitary liver axis to get your IGF. Um, growth hormone releasing hormone that comes out of the hypothalamus, out of the anterior pituitary, you get your growth hormone, wait a while, and eventually, not right away, but you will eventually uh, get your IGF unless you're fasting, and then that gets blocked, that gets suppressed. Um, but you will post growth hormone, the liver will release um, IGF. And binding protein, you know, binding protein three, eighty percent of your IGF is bound to. But following exercise, following an exertional stimulus, the IGF does more than reassemble the proteins of the muscle. It has additional uh, functions. Um, <laughs> Phrasing in, in, in this is uh, IGF one has been the subjects of many researches. It's a decent article. It is sort of funny English, but uh, pivotal roles, right? It has pivotal roles in metabolic processes and growth. It's critical for growth. However, when you let's do some, let's have some mouse models and look at IGF deficient mice. And this is these IGF-1 uh, deficient animals, whatever, LID. Uh, these, they were able to develop physically okay. Cognitively, not as much. The brain relies on IGF-2. More than the muscle, I don't know, who cares? Uh, but the brain, IGF is critical for normal neural development. You need IGF for that uh, as well. And if you have an IGF deficiency or you have an IGF overexpression, you will see that in the weight of the brain, the actual size and mass of the brain changes. Um, this IGF-1 overexpression causes increase in brain weight after day 10. These are mice. Again, there's a lot of you know, mouse studies here. Um, enlargements of the brain stem, the cerebellum, the cerebral cortex, and the hippocampus, all these brain areas are enlarged physically, larger and heavier brains in the presence of IGF. So it's not just biceps or like glutes or whatever. Um, it's not, IGF is not just a hormone that uh, stimulates hypertrophy, skeletal muscle hypertrophy. It also is critical uh, for the brain. And um, it's very diverse roles uh, with this stuff. So again, um, the myelin production, same thing that BDNF is doing, looking at the, the myelin uh, in the central nervous system. IGF is partly responsible for that. And we'll talk more about this, but, but exercise 
exercise isn't something that people, you know, 10,000 years ago, we're not like, let's get on the treadmill, you know, push-ups or like my you know, whatevers. Um, that, you know, like CrossFit didn't exist 5,000 years ago. What people were doing for exercise thousands of years ago was food acquisition. Let's go hunt um, or, you know, let's flee the predators. There's some sort of survival. And at the end of that, when you get this surge of factors, you have to recall what worked, what didn't work, right? What was effective? Um, and, and so to reinforce some of these behaviors, cognition is required, was connected. And we'll talk a ton about that when we start talking about exercise, but um, exercise elicits this response and that response helps to reinforce what the behavior was. Um, you know, again, same thing, looking at like myelination um, and you know, increased thickness of the myelin sheet. Uh, with, uh, with IGF. Now, uh, this is in vivo. Over here, we have in vitro looking at it, meaning in glass, the petri test. In vivo, we're in creatures. We're in the actual creatures, and we're seeing uh, more of myelin. Um, same article. This is a really good article from 2017 talking about IGF. And, and this is one of the uh, subcategories, one, one, of, one of the subsections. IGF 1 and the adult brain prolonged survival, reduced cell death. Resistance to injury, uh, reparation, and neuroplasticity in response to environmental cues. Those environmental cues are what we'll talk about. Uh, getting into both the uh, flow states or, or the zone, or whatever you want to call it, uh, and exercise, what those environmental cues are. But this diverse set of functions, critical functions to neural and cognitive health. Uh, connected to IGF-1. Now, here's the hippocampus. We'll talk about the amygdala also. We'll talk about that. Um, there's the cerebellum. Um, we've been talking about that, but the hippocampus, just two of it, right? Again, it's like the seahorse, the hippocampus, the seahorse uh, of the brain, and transitioning these um, short, acute, experiential uh, events, the, the, the short-term memory into what persists what lasts, what we take with us, long-term memory. Uh, the hippocampus is critical for that stuff. Damage the hippocampus and good luck having that. Uh, now, every cell, we're constantly changing. We're constantly changing um, fitness, right? We're trying to be fit to our environment. We're trying to be suitable to our environment. Uh, we're trying to be optimized or appropriate to the environmental stresses that we endure. And every single cell is doing that. Every cell is constantly changing and neurons are changing a lot, right? That plasticity question, that, that malleability, these neurons are constantly uh, changing. And there's tons of different adaptations uh, that it can take on. Um, you know, what the glial cells are doing, what the dendrites are doing, um, the, the synapses, what's happening there. Uh, the concentration of receptors. There's all these different uh, cells and proteins that change, the myelination, there's so many things. And it's trying again to be most suitable, most appropriate uh, to the uh, environment. Um, but looking at, at the growth and IGF-1 and all of its, all of its functions, um, the axonal sprouting, um, and the genesis of, of dendrites, the formation of new synapses. This is plasticity, hopefully in a positive way. This is plasticity, hopefully in a positive way. So there's a nice summary, dose-dependent regulation. A little bit of IGF goes a little distance. A lot of IGF goes a larger distance. Remember this overexpression study. Having an overexpression of IGF and you're seeing um, this cognitive development, a heavier brain, a little overexpression, a big overexpression is dose dependent. Um, neurogenesis, um, the oligodendrogenesis, uh, neuronal excitability, uh, neurotransmitter release being modified, uh, membrane channels, the nutrient home uh, homeostasis. This one, what, what we think of as during exercise you get um, energy stress, 
Right? You chop up a bunch of ATP, you get a bunch of AMP, AMP activated energy stuff. And balancing this new, being sensitive to nutrients and nutrient signaling and nutrient storage. Um, IGF-1 is partly responsible for that, but it has all of these other uh, functions uh, at the same time. Um, okay, NAPK and PI3K. Uh, it does both of them. There's PI3K, PKB, and MAPK. It's more about PI3K than MAPK, but it does do both vascular endothelial growth factor. Everything you do is oxidative event. Every task, no matter how intense the exercise, oxygen is involved. Right? Everything is an oxidative event. Um, an infarction, right? That's anoxic. Like you're getting an anoxic injury of something if, if, uh, if something's not an oxidative event. You have to be able to supply the oxygen. Otherwise, it literally is an infarction. You know, skeletal muscle infarction or, or cerebrovascular accidents, pulmonary embolism, whatever. You need to be able to detect how much oxygen is on board, how much is available, is it low? And when you have low levels of oxygen, you're going to stimulate VEGF, and that stimulates uh, vasculogenesis and angiogenesis. Let's create the roadwork, the ability to supply more blood. If oxygen is low, then obviously you need something to change in the cardiovascular system to be able to provide sufficient oxygen. It does this in the brain too. Um, the expansion of vasculature in the brain. When we start talking about exercise, we'll talk about uh, oxygen supply to the brain. It's not quite what was originally uh, believed. What was originally thought about oxygenation of the brain during exercise has been updated. Uh, but we have to be able to supply the brain with oxygen. And VEGF, that's where the field growth, growth factor does that, and neurogenesis. Uh, it does uh, both. Um, so this bird view, this, this little molecule right here, is a nice marker for neurogenesis. And when you see the control compared to the VEGF, this study will be in the um, file folder later, um, you know, three days, two weeks, you're, you're seeing these, these differences um, of the control and the VEGF uh, for neurogenesis. So it's not just how much vasculature is in there, neurogenesis as well. And then the fibroblast growth factor, uh, really short slide section on it. A plethora, an abundance, right, of studies have demonstrated the crucial role of fibroblast growth factor in neurogenesis, both in proliferation and differentiation of stem cells during development and in the adult brain. And we'll talk about all of these in a couple of different perspectives, but one of them as we get stressed, as we get depressed, as we get old, we see decreases in all of these. These things decrease throughout life or, or in particular circumstances, these things can decrease. Exercise does the opposite. And we'll talk all about that uh, later. But for today, we're done with basic brain function, neurotransmitters and factors. Right, how the brain works. Um, next, we'll talk about ideal performance state. And this is going to be mostly about neurotransmitters. And then we'll talk about uh, brain health with exercise. And this is a lot more factors, but it's everything. This really is comprehensive of everything. And that's it for today. It feels like Friday. <laughs> Friday just happened last lecture. And I feel like this too should be a Friday. But I see enough uh, yawning and stretching that I feel. Oh my gosh, it's freezing. Well, thanks for watching.